Systolic performance means the overall force generated by the ventricular muscle during systole. Under normal conditions, increasing the force of contraction during systole increases cardiac output. Therefore, I will use the cardiac output as the determinant of systolic performance. Systolic performance of the ventricle is affected by three variables, preload, afterload, and contractility. First, let's talk about the preload and see how it affects the systolic performance of the left ventricle. It is very important to know that during diastole, when the ventricular muscle is in a relaxed state, blood starts filling it and pre-stretches the ventricular muscle. The preload is actually the pre-stretch on the ventricular muscle at the end of diastole. It is important to note that the preload on the ventricular muscle is not measured directly because we cannot practically measure the pre-stretch on ventricular muscle, right? Therefore, in a clinical practice, we measure the factor that caused this pre-stretch. The pre-stretch on the ventricular muscle is caused by volume of blood and pressure in a ventricle during diastole. This brings us to the indices of left ventricular preload. The best indices of left ventricular preload are those measured directly in a ventricle like left ventricular and diastolic pressure and left ventricular and diastolic volume. And diastolic volume is the amount of blood in a ventricle at end of diastole just before the contraction. And it is the best index of preload because it is easier measured in a clinical practice by using echocardiography. So other indices of preload are left atrial pressure, pulmonary venous pressure, pulmonary wedge pressure. Pulmonary wedge pressure is measured by inserting Swan-Ganz catheter into a peripheral vein like jugular or femoral vein, then advancing the catheter into the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and then into a branch of the pulmonary artery. Just behind the tip of the catheter is a small balloon that can be inflated with air. And right there we measure the pressure. The balloon is then deflated and catheter removed. However, in some cases, such as in mitral stenosis, pulmonary wedge pressure is not a good index of left ventricular preload because mitral stenosis causes increasing the pressure upstream in the left atrium and pulmonary veins, whereas downstream in the left ventricle it decreases pressure. Now, let's see how the preload affects the systolic performance of the left ventricle. In a nutshell, within the physiologic limit, increased preload increases the cardiac output, whereas decreasing preload decreases cardiac output. Let me draw here three hearts, and we do a few experiments with the heart by changing preload. Under resting condition, before contraction, the ventricle already has approximately 70 ml of blood. This volume is called end systolic volume. The venous return is 70 ml, which means that during diastole, the ventricle receives another 70 ml of blood. This 140 ml is called an diastolic volume, which is the preload. So, every beat, the ventricle ejects approximately 70 ml blood from this 140. And this is called stroke volume. If you increase the preload by increasing venous return, suppose we increase the venous return up to 130 ml instead of 70 ml which the ventricle has to receive. The end diastolic volume increases up to 200 ml. 
increasing preload more pre-stretches the ventricular muscle and the ventricle contracts more forcefully and ejects not 70 mils but instead it increases stroke volume up to 130 mils. If instead I decrease the venous return down to 50 mils, the end diastolic volume decreases down to 120 mils. This decrease in preload pre-stretches the ventricular muscle less and the ventricle decreases the force of contraction which in turn decreases stroke volume down to 50 mils. So to sum it up, the force of contraction depends on the preload. Increased preload increases cardiac output, whereas decreased preload decreases cardiac output by altering the force of contraction of the cardiac muscle. If you have noted in all our diagrams, the stroke volume is equal to venous return. This mechanism is known as the Frank Starling mechanism. So the Frank Starling mechanism says within physiologic limits, the heart pumps all the blood that returns to it by the way of the veins. I will draw here a graph to repeat one more time what we have said. In an x-axis we have the end diastolic volume or preload and in a y-axis we have the stroke volume. Under resting conditions the heart operates in this point where the end diastolic volume is 140 mils and stroke volume is 70 mils. The Frank Starling law says if I decrease the preload the stroke volume also falls down. If instead I increase the preload, the stroke volume also starts rising. Of course, this happens within the physiologic limit. If I increase the preload above the physiologic limit, the stroke volume goes down. Another important point to remember is that stretching the ventricular muscle leads to increasing the cross-bridge cycling and the sensitivity of the contractile machinery to calcium and increases the force of contraction. So preload increases with exercise which increases it slightly increased blood volume in case like over transfusion. Excitement also increases preload when the sympathetic activity is increased. Preload decreases with decreased venous blood pressure most commonly resulting from reduced blood volume in case of hemorrhage and venodilation.